Okay, well now I got a thumbs up, so off we go to the races. Glad to see you all here today, and those who are visiting for the first time, wow, I, I very, very much appreciate you being here. It's, it's awesome to have people, new people, just coming in and being here with us, yeah. Um, and, and those who haven't been for a while and miss a lot and they're back, you know, we're glad to see you too, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and those that are always here, hey, you know, you know I love you, right? <laughs> All right. So, today, hey, you know what? This is, this, is prob this is the first book of the Bible that I wrote a commentary on, way back when I first started doing that. Uh, the book of Romans was, because it, it's, it's so important, I think it, it's just, um, I, I, I like to nickname, nickname it Christianity 101, because if you're going to go to Bible school and you want a good foundational foundation you know, to start on, to build on, the book of Romans kind of hits all of those different things. Um, this book is it's the perfect primer for Christian doctrine. If you wanted to learn, you know, what is it the church is supposed to be about? This book is a great primer for that. Um, the first eight chapters are doctrinal, in case you're wondering. As we go through it, the first eight chapters will be doctrinal. They'll teach you the, the things that are supposed to be, right? Um, and, and it talk, deals a lot about, uh, you could break it down, sin, salvation, and sanctification. You could break it down to those because it kind of does that. Also, there's the famous Roman road to salvation. People have used that for years. The verses that you might have memorized where you start off usually with 323, you know, and you go on through and, and you pretty much have your whole plan of salvation all mapped out in the verses that you can take right out of the book of Romans. Anyway, it's an awesome way that God made to, uh, to save us uh, from sin that enslaved us. Uh, it's an awesome way that he did it, and this book tells us how that comes about and how to understand it properly. Um, forget everything that you ever learned that churches, do denominational churches, groups have all maybe had a different, like, we stand this way, and, or we stand this way, and every church has a different we believe kind of thing. My thing is I believe the Bible, and, and I don't care what any of the rest of them believe and what they've always said. It doesn't doesn't matter if old granny used to always say this, you know, or old brother so-and-so used to teach it this way. What does the Bible say? That's really what matters. And I have been proven wrong so many times when I've thought that, oh, brother so-and-so used to teach it this way, so that's the way I believed it. But then in studying the Bible, I found out, oh, brother so-and-so was a little mistaken. It didn't mean bad, but he just had it kind of wrong, you know. So really, what does the Bible teach us? And, and that's what we're going to get in through. So Salvation is offered to us freely through faith in Christ. Jesus paid it all, like the old hymn. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow, right? You all remember that, right? That was the theme song to uh, J. Vernon McGee's Through the Bible Radio. Remember that? Through the Bible radio on there, that was they had, he had this male a cappello uh, quartet that's that sang that 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 old hymn. Any, anyway, that's it's still on some stations. I think he's, I'm, I'm not like old, old, really that old. I mean, it's still out there. Anyway, chapters 9 through 11, when we get through there, we'll learn that Israel as a nation was judged. As a nation, remember that Israel as a nation was judged and um, punished for unfaithfulness to God and denying her Messiah. So, um, we'll get that in, verse, in chapters 9 through 11. It's, it's, there's a section in this book all about Israel. And, but Israel's not gone and forgotten. Israel is still part of God's plan, but they were punished. Like you punish any child that disobeyed and did wrong, right? But they are still God's chosen nation in the world. They are still that. So anyway, uh, they, they, meaning any, any Israeli, anybody of that line of, of race, can come to salvation the same way anybody else does. It's no different. We all come to salvation the same way, through faith in Christ, just like any human is. There's no preferential treatment for being of Jacob's bloodline. The, the preferential treatment they got was that they had the revealed word of God, where the rest of us had to wait till they might want to tell us about it. 
right? And so, anyway, um, that they did have an advantage there, but there's no preferential treatment for bloodline when it comes to salvation. We all stand at the equal footing at the foot of the cross, and it's faith in Christ that, that finds salvation no other way. Um, so, also Israel as a nation will someday be restored to greatness with Christ reigning as her king. Whenever the full number of Gentiles is gathered, now that's a phrase we'll find in this book, whenever the full number of Gentiles is gathered in. So, you might ask, well, what's the final number? I don't know. I don't know. There's somebody who, who has not yet accepted Christ as Savior and put their faith in Him that will be that final number. When that happens, that's the final number. But I don't know who that is, right? So even if, if, you're, if you're sharing your faith with someone and they come to faith in Christ, they're not the last one. They just keep on going. Unless you hear trumpets calling, you know, or something like that. Then you might say, oh, well, maybe that was the final number of the Gentiles. But whenever that is, when they've been gathered in, that's when he'll return. Yeah, we'll learn that. Um, so then in the final five chapters we will get some application as to how we are to live in this world as the church of Christ until we are gathered in and Christ returns. How do we occupy until He comes? So that, that will be there. So um, the two in this book... Who's it written to? Uh, he's specific. Verse 7 says that he's, he's writing to the saints. Okay? So bear that in mind when you're reading this book. It's written to believers, not unbelievers. So this book is not written to unbelievers. Okay? Give them a break. You know, don't expect them to measure up to everything this book says you have to have uh, down. They're not a believer. Why would we expect the believers to act like believers when they're not? Right? Okay, this book is written to the target audience are believers, specifically those in Rome, but it was meant to be shared after it got there. Um, so the importance and impact, and I really wanted to share this with you um, before we really get into the meat of the letter, because the importance and impact of this letter to the Romans um, is great. And I have three different little story snippets that I'm going to share with you for, from famous individuals, and you might know who they are, if not, I'll, I'll end up explaining it anyway. First, in the summer of 386 A.D., nobody knows who I'm talking about yet, right? All right, okay. 386 A.D., a young man wept in the backyard of a friend. He knew that his life of sin and rebellion against God was killing him, leaving him empty. But he just couldn't find the strength to make a, a final real decision for Jesus Christ. As he sat, he heard some children playing a game, and they called out to each other with these words, Take up and read! Take up and read! Thinking God had a message to him through the words of the children, he picked up a scroll that was laying nearby, opened it, and began to read. Where he read, it said, Not in reveling in drunkenness, no, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. That came from Romans 13, 13 and 14. That's where he just happened to read when he picked up the scroll. Take up and read. And he, you know, so then, he didn't read any further. He didn't have to. Through the power of God's Word, Augustine had faith to entrust his whole life to Jesus Christ at that moment. And he was a great leader, and you might say in Reformation of sorts, in the church in the beginning. By the way, it wasn't really called the Catholic Church back in those days. It was just the church, and Catholic meant unified, right? That's what the word means. So that's who Augustine, who later they called Saint Augustine, or Augustine if you're one of those, you know, whatever, same guy. Uh, that's, that was his story. Number two, in August, now we're going to go a little further in, in time, August of 1513, a monk lectured on the book of Psalms in a seminary, but his inner life was nothing but turmoil. In his studies, he came across Psalm 31.1. It says, In thy righteousness deliver me. The passage confused him. How could God's righteousness do anything but condemn him to hell as a righteous punishment for his sins? Right? That was his, mind, his way of thinking. 
he kept thinking about Romans 1.17, which says that in, in the gospel, um, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Habakkuk 2.4 where that comes from. So this, he's reminded of this. So the monk went on to say, night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy he justifies us by faith. Therefore I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. This passage of Paul became to me a gateway into heaven. He was born again. His name was Martin Luther. And the Reformation began in his heart then, that day. Third, in May of 1738, now we're getting a little more modern, right? Because you all remember 1738. <laughs> a failed minister and missionary went unwillingly to a small Bible study where someone read aloud from Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. As the failed missionary said later, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken my sins, even mine, away. John Wesley was saved that night in London. Now, you guys might know, you know, who, who the, the first guy was. I, I explained that, Augustine, and then Martin Luther, you've heard of, not King, but Martin, the one he was named after. Martin Luther, the Lutheran people, the great uh, Reformation they have, the Prop Protestant Reformation. A great movie, too, by, if you, uh, by the way, if you get the movie Luther, not the series, but the movie Luther, it's about his life, and it, it's, it's a good, there's a good one out there. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, the Lutheran churches all came out of that and many others that were influenced by then. And John Wesley, in case you don't know who that is, the Wesleyan churches are named after him, but the bigger would be the Methodist church because he had kind of a method to go about things and they adopted it and named it after that and it was based on John Wesley. Um, so uh, anyway, he, big influential people in the church in the beginning. Now what their denominations do later on, that's not their fault. You know, but, but the, these guys started out and they did have a great influence. And the thing that ignited that in them and made them so influential in the church was the effect the book of Romans had on them when they really just took the time to digest it. To just take it like we do here, a, a chapter at a time, verse by verse, and, and take a good understanding from a contextual understanding of what the writer is saying to who and how does this mean, how does it work for us? And take it and chew on it. Now, as I always like to say, I'm not going to get in a big hurry as we go through this book. It's like panning for gold. You get some scoop of some material in there and you got water in the pan and you go like this. And if you slosh too fast, you'll lose some nuggets out with that too, right? You, you want to slosh out the dirt, but you want to keep the gold nuggets. Right? So that's the way we approach Bible study. We want to make sure we get everything the Lord is, it has for us in this. The Bible is multifaceted. And it's, it's God's Word to us. It comes alive to us. That's why I say it's a living thing. Um, and, and it will mean something to you differently today than it did the last time you read that verse. Because the Bible affects you where you are now. The Lord, the, His Word, He speaks to us through His Word where we are now based on what we're going through now. And so it'll hit us where the same verse maybe might not, might not have been a big deal the last time I read it, but this time, wow, it sticks out to me. So be, be aware of that. All right, so now we're going to look, here we go. We're going to start. Chapter 1, uh, I want to read the first four verses. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, 
and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, now remember, every time we read that, I like to pause a little bit. I don't always do it, but I like to, because Christ is not his last name. Right? All right. Jesus is his name. That's the name he was given. All right. He would have been in, 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 in real time back then, he would have been called Jesus Bar Joseph, right? Or Ben Joseph, depending on you know what dialect in the Hebrew or whatever. Or at the very least, Jesus of Nazareth, his hometown. Okay. But uh, usually they would go by their father, their earthly father's name, and his, the guy that raised him was Joseph. So he would have been Jesus Bar Joseph or Ben Joseph or Jesus of Nazareth. Christ is the Greek word that is the same word as Messiah is the Hebrew word, the Messiah. Right? Okay, same word. So you could call him Jesus Messiah or you can call him Jesus Christ. But it's a loaded statement to say Jesus Christ. That's a loaded statement right there. I shouldn't even be able to say Jesus Christ unless I believe he is the Christ. He's the Messiah, the one God promised in the old scriptures. So when I say his full name and title like that, I'm state, it's a statement of faith. Although for a lot of people, it's a byword and swear word, you know, I and mean, that's, that's why to me it's just so, you know, that's just so disrespectful. Um, I don't like to hear that. So anyway, when I say Jesus Christ, I'm making a statement of faith or praying and talking to him, right? All right. So anyway, in case you missed it, Paul wrote this book. Verse 1, first, Paul wrote this book. In case you didn't catch that, all right? Paul used the term bond servant of Jesus Christ. In other words, um, in, in other writings, he said that a lot. Which was a, in case you wonder what a bond servant was, a bond servant is a volunteer servant for life. Um, the Jewish law permitted for indentured servitude to pay debts. Okay, um, and also for that servant at the end of his time of indentured, um, indenturement, or whatever, if that's a really a word, um, um, he could volunteer service to his master for life if, if he volunteered. And they would have to go get some elders from the town uh, to witness his statement to that fact. That way they could weed it out. Is he being coerced? Is he being forced? No, he means that he wants to voluntarily be this man's servant for his life. And then he would be allowed. And then what they would do if this was a bond servant like that, they, the, the practice then was they'd go to the doorpost of the house, take their ear, and pierce it with an awl, and usually they had some sort of earring. A lot of times it was a family uh, crest kind of thing or a little symbol or whatever to the family that he belonged to now. And they would wear it proudly. The uh, bond servant was they could walk around with their head held high in town because you probably got uh, the boss's checkbook. You know, you can probably sign for it for stuff for him. You're that trusted, you're family. And they were taken in like family. So that's a bond servant, volunteer service. So anyway, that's, that's what Paul considers himself of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ was promised through the prophets in the Old Testament. He says that in these verses. He was the royal bloodline of David in his human nature. And that's um, all weeded out in the Matthew and Luke's Gospels. They, they tell that. I like John's Gospel a little better, though, because it tells who he really was. All right? I really like that one. Um, but anyway, as far as human bloodline, he is a descendant of David. Um, through, through, um, he would have been through Joseph if Joseph was actually his father. But back in the history, that guy had a curse put on One of those guys in the middle had a curse put on him that none of his descendants would be on the throne of David. So it switches over and it comes down the line through his mother. And then Mary's dad, by the way, reckoned Joseph his son by law. And that was their old phrase, son-in-law, that we use now. So by law, then, Jesus um, gets this inheritance through his mother's 
bloodline, and that's where it came from. In case you're wondering, and some of you are like, I know he said this before, let's get on with it. All right, here we go. So uh, he was promised, and this is who Paul represents, by the way, this, this one, Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of God, this is who Paul represents. He's putting that out first paragraph. I want you to know who I'm talking for. I'm his sent one which is what the word apostle means. He's an apostle of Jesus. He was the sent one. But um, we can take that word apostle and just use it loosely. A, a sent one. You know, missionaries probably could be called apostles, whatever. But there really were only 12 real apostles. 13 men had the job offered to them. One deferred and and didn't take it, but each, each one of these, the true apostles were those who Jesus himself handpicked them, face to face, called them to be his apostle. So anyone else after that that claimed to be an apostle isn't one in the truest sense. Uh, maybe the looser sense, but not in the truest sense. There were only 12. And Paul is this 13th given the invitation. So the 12th apostle. That's who this guy is. All right, now I'm going to move on to verses 5 through 7. I hope you're not bored yet. Nope. Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, this pretty much then says who he's writing it to, the Roman Christians, the, all of them who are called to come to Christ. You know, um, a lot of um, nice language in the way he says that. You'll notice in Paul's writings, grace and peace shows up a lot in English. And um, so you might understand a very common greeting on the street. Nowadays it's, dude, you know, or whatever. <laughs> Our common greeting, we meet with each other, you know, how's it going? What's up? You know, all these kinds of things. A very common greeting in this first century A.D. among Greek people, people of academia or whatever that, that, that learned Greek and spoke the Greek language, um, was charis. And you're like, Charis. Charis is a word I... Anyway. Um, that wasn't Charis, was it? But it means the same thing. Anyway, Charis was this Greek word for um, grace. Grace, that's what it meant. So you, you'd meet someone you, you see on the street that you know, you know and you'd say, grace. It's so like, grace to you. You know, it's kind of like what you're saying. Like, Peace, man, you know, that's the other one. The Hebrew common gesture, uh, you know, it wasn't the peace sign, but they would say shalom. They still do, by the way. Very common greeting in the Jewish people, shalom. That means peace. Shalom. So anyway, so the two, both in the Greek culture and the Hebrew culture, whichever one this, the, the reader is, is used to being, hearing from, if they have some Jewish background and they know a lot of Hebrew, then they would identify with the shalom. And if they're of the Greek academia, I learned to, to read and write in school in, in the Greek language and I've been influenced by the rest of the world, I would learn Greek and, and I probably understood Cheris, you know. So he hits his, his common greeting with everybody. Everybody, it's grace and peace. So he hits them both, and that's Paul's common thing. You'll notice in other writing, other books that he wrote, he also uses it a lot. So now that took a long time to say that, but anyway, back up to verse eight. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will the way may be opened for me to come to you. You see, um, well first he's thinking God was his first typical in his prayers, um, and their faith was known abroad. People had heard about this small fledgling church that was mostly underground in Rome, uh, but how strong their faith was. 
These were people that were hurt, known to just have a strong, sincere faith in Christ that were there in Rome. Um, Paul didn't plant this church. In his other letters that he writes, except for the letters to Timothy and Titus, but in the other letters that Paul writes, he writes to a church that he helped start. In some town, you know, the Galatians, the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Colossians, Corinthians, Thessalonians. These are all places where Paul went on his missionary trip and started a church. And then he writes a letter to these people. But the Romans, he didn't start that church there. He just really wanted to go visit them. Somebody else had got there with the gospel in Rome already. And it, not, not, uh, it's very understandable because, you know, if they're affected somewhere out in their travels through the whole Roman Empire, they're affected by the gospel message and they become a Christian and then they travel back to Rome or whatever, they're going to take it with them. So somebody carried the gospel back to Rome and it's there and it's not popular, but it hasn't caused a big uprising yet, so it's not necessarily being persecuted quite yet, but it does get to where they very much are being persecuted heavily later, fed to the lions and all that kind of stuff later. Um, so, But anyway, they, they still are keeping it quiet. They're kind of on the down low about their, their, their Christianity there in Rome. Um, but they have great faith, and Paul wants to go visit them. I'm hoping the way will be open for me to come visit you, he says. And it will happen, and it's going to be all expenses paid, because he's going to go under arrest when he goes. He's going to be arrested and taken to Rome. So, uh, paid for a trip, right? And guarded along the way against the Jews that wanted to stone him all the time. You know, so he had a Roman detachment of guards guarding him all the way there because he had appealed to Caesar and happened to be a Roman citizen. So he had that right. So he had to be protected. So God knew what he was doing. Uh, anyway, still hoping to go to Rome. This was written prior to his going to Rome, obviously, uh, because he had not met them yet and didn't start that church. Verse 11 through 13. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among other Gentiles. A harvest among them is just means a reward, um, a spiritual reward for the work done there. So he wants to go and plant some seed, water some seed, teach them a little bit more, and then see that, that harvest come, come out of it. New Christians maybe, some that maybe um, develop in their faith better, become teachers, that would be a harvest for Paul. All of that would just be a spiritual harvest and a blessing. He knows that if he goes and serves the Lord, he's going to reap a harvest. No matter where he does, when he serves the Lord, there's some kind of harvest there. And he looks forward to that with these people. Um, so anyway, all right, verses 14 through 17. I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. There's that phrase there. The righteous will live by faith. And where was it written? Habakkuk 2.4, right? So that's, that was a quote from the prophet Habakkuk that Paul put into this. So that's where um, Luther tripped over this, and he tripped over it hard, and he's like, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And it echoed in his, in his think, thinking, because he's so accustomed to what the church was doing at his time. You know, the, the, you know the, they, they, you could buy your salvation, basically. 
in Luther's time, the church had been, become, well, if you do this and you do this, then you can claim that you're a Christian believer. But you've got to be paying your, uh, a tithe to the temple uh, wherever you're at, the, the Catholic Church. Remember, this was like in the, what was it, the 1500s? So it was the Catholic Church by that time. And um, you could go to the priest and, and you could say, hey, you know, I want to be absolved from being a bad guy. You guys, are, everyone knows that I robbed those people back a couple years ago and all that stuff, and, and I got away with it and everything, but I feel bad about it. So I want to give a gift to the church so you'll absolve me of my sins. And the guy would do like this, you know, and he'd, he, he's all cleared, right? Or a guy could be saying, hey, um, I'm going to be making a trip over to Rome uh, next week or something like that. And, I, and I'm really planning on tying one on big when I get there. And I'm going to visit the, the, the prostitute house when I get there too and everything. So um, how can we be covered for that before I go? And, and well, the priest would say, well, you know, for so many, how much dollars it was or whatever the time, buy an indulgence. That's what they called it, an indulgence. And so they would pay them off, and then, then the priest would give them their blessing and everything, and they would go on, and they, could, they had an indulgence. They could go, you know, go commit a bunch of sin, and they're cleared of it. Plan it in, in advance and all kinds of stuff like that. This was what was happening. Talk about a perversion uh, of the church, right? As if the priest had the power to decide... Right? You know, it's God is the one who forgives, and it's between you and Him, each individual. You don't come to me and ask me to give you a pass. You know, and you don't come to me and ask for absolution for a, for a sin that you committed. I can't give you that. Only God can do that. I'll point you to the right way. You know, but I don't want to know all the nitty-gritty details. That's too heavy of a burden for me to handle. There's some things about you I don't want to know. Right? I still want to look at you and smile and shake your hand, you know? I, I, I might have to be going, uh, um, um, yeah, I good to see you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, I don't want to know all the nitty-gritty de details. And, and, you know, the, the Lord knows this. Take it to Him. Now, if you've, you're really struggling with something and you need someone to unburden on and everything, then find somebody. It doesn't have to be the pastor, though. Just saying, you know. You could, some, make sure it's someone that doesn't have a blabbermouth. You don't pick your, your, your friend to confide in as the biggest gossip in town either, you know, because you might as well just put it out on a billboard, you know. But anyway, so that, that's the thing. Um, this was going on in Luther's time, and Luther comes across this verse, the righteous shall live by faith. Not by a grant from the, from the church or um, having to do a certain list of do's and don'ts or anything like that. It's my faith in Christ. Now, how am I right? And, it, and he understood that righteousness then was not of that person's own righteous, but they were being declared righteous because of faith. You see, that's what we find here. We find a righteousness that is not mine. A righteousness that I didn't earn or create. It's a righteousness that I borrow from someone who truly is righteous. See, Jesus is, is the righteous, right? I borrow His. I stand in the presence of God because I'm covered in the righteousness of Jesus. Not because of good works that I did. I mean, not, if it's up to me, I wouldn't be standing. Right? But I stand in the presence of God because of my covering of Christ's righteousness. It's a concept that was even in the Gospels. By the way, the Gospels really aren't New Testament, it wasn't, it wasn't the New Covenant when they were written. Well, well, when they were written, it was. But when they were told about times, the times of Jesus, that was kind of at the end of the Old Testament, by the way. They were still, because Jesus hadn't gone to the cross and died and raised yet when he was saying all those things and teaching the parables. So anyway, we learn these things about the gospel and, and what was taught in that. But even Jesus said that um, there was going to be this, this righteousness that is not of yours. You don't earn it. You don't come up with it on your own. It's borrowed. And he taught that concept in many of his parables. Like the parable of the rich man that sent out wedding clothes for people to put on. And if they were going to come to the wedding, they had to come in the clothes that were sent, not in their own clothing. That's a parable of us understanding that I don't go to heaven clothed in my own righteousness. It's the, what was provided for me. 
I go up to heaven wearing the cloak, figurative language here, of Christ's righteousness covering me. That's the only way I get in. You see, there, a lot of his parables were talking truth about this, and, and people somehow will always tend to pervert it and try to bring legalism into it. Oh, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do that, you got to do that, and you better not ever do this, or this, 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 you know, and we, we always create a new list of do's and don'ts. All the churches try to do it, but it's not legalism that gets you to heaven. You know, uh, legalism will keep you from having a, a fun time in many churches. But it won't have anything to do with you being in heaven. It's your faith in Christ's work. He paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin le leaves a crimson sta stain, but He washes it white as snow. See, that's what this is all about. And that's what Paul is going to be talking about. He's obligated to both Greeks and non-Greeks, meaning, you know, um, everybody. That's just a big, wide-sweeping thing to everybody. I'm obligated to everybody to get this message out. See, to, this really is good news, and it really is a great hope, right? It gives you hope because, wow, because I was worried about that because I didn't know how I was ever going to stand before a righteous judge because I know I'm not good, right? I know what's going on inside of me, and I know I'm not good, and I'm not worthy, and I can't stand before a God. So it's a good thing this, this provision came that covers me, and that's where I'm going, I'm not going to be out there knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door saying, as Jesus told in the other parable, Lord, Lord, didn't we heal the sick in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all these works, volunteer in the mission field? Didn't we do all these things in your name? Why are we on the outside knocking? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. They're standing on their own. They're trying to come in clothed with their own works. Didn't we do this? Did, see, I did this in your name. I did this in your name. I did this. My, my faith is in my works that I did. Right? That's what they're saying. That's why they're on the outside knocking. While everybody else whose faith was in his work was already inside. Didn't have to knock. You know, Paul says, we know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Father. I'm not going to be having to knock on heaven's door and answer a bunch of questions. Why should I let you in? That's not going to happen. That's not the way it works. So, you know, I'm very grateful for that. And that's my great hope. Because I have, because of my faith, I have been saved from the penalty of all my sin. Even the ones I haven't done yet. I'm saved from the penalty that sin had on me. And I am currently being saved from the power sin would have over my life. We have their three tenses, right? That was past and present. Someday I will be saved from the very presence of sin where I don't even have to try anymore. I don't even have to worry about it. I don't have to fight the monkey in the backpack that wants me to go the wrong way and do the wrong thing and think the wrong thoughts and say the wrong things. You know, I don't even have to fight that anymore. And, and I'm, I'm there. I'm with him. I'm standing in the presence of God because of my faith. That's my hope. I hope it's your hope too. I hope so. See, yeah, that's a different hope. I hope so on that because I don't know for sure. But the, this, this hope is not a, I hope so. I hope I get to go to heaven. No. It's I have that hope because I know I have it. So we didn't get all that far into the book of Romans yet. Like I said, it, it's too much to take. But a lot of fluff at the beginning, kind of. You know, a lot of... Uh, you know, the, this is who I am, and that's who I'm writing to, and I, I've been eager to. We haven't really got into a really much meat yet. There's still more in this first chapter. We'll get into some things in this first chapter next week that, that, um, that we'll get into some, some deep theology, some doctrine things that are starting to happen. But anyway, this is, I'm, I'm really happy to be in this book. It's really a great one to go through and to study through. So I hope you'll all be here ready to take on that next bit and that next bite out of the book of Romans next time. And I'll look forward to seeing you then. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and what you've granted us in it. Um, may these words, Lord, resonate in our hearts. Um, may you be changing us and molding us into the image of Christ as we are being washed in your word. So that, Lord, we might stand up, even while here in this in this world, stand as beacons of light that reflect your light 
into this dark community that we're in. Let us make a difference. Let us point the way and show the way and lift you up in all that we do as we lift up your word. And we thank you for the opportunity and all of these things that we pray are through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with all of you this week.